Hello you all, good morning. This is Steve here on a sunny if slightly chilly morning. Um, I've Just let me see if I can get Instagram up and going because that at present doesn't have very good connection. Let's go 3G there, that should probably be enough. Okay you all, so uh, we're going to be doing another live lesson here this morning. Um, and I'm going to start off with some of your questions because I can see already there's a whole bunch rocketing in. Uh, so Finn Beals, who's seven, wants to know uh, he's in Norfolk and he's been out looking for snakes. Is now a good time? Uh, well, to be honest, we are we are quite early. I mean, this is exactly the sort of time that I'd expect to start seeing adders and grass snakes. Uh, but yeah, it, it's early. It'll happen. Stick with it. Uh, if it stays warm and sunny like this, then it is going to be absolutely perfect. Uh, I've got a whole bunch have come in already from Australia. Uh, so Gemma Boyson from Canberra says, does the mantis live after laying its egg sac? Uh, yes, usually it does. There's one right there, an Uthaka or egg sac. And yes, she would survive after laying that. Uh, James and Lily Wamel from Darwin ask, does venom have colour? Usually it's kind of colourless or a, a slightly yellowy colour, venom. Um, and we have Emma Herney, who is uh, again in Australia, and it's her eighth birthday. A very happy birthday to you, Emma. So things are going to be a, a little bit different today. So I'm not just going to be doing uh, wildlife Q&As, but uh, as I mentioned uh, last time round, I have also had a very busy week. So I spent this week putting up various cameras uh, all around my garden and also uh, around the local Badgers set as well. Uh, so I am going to be, for as long as we're in lockdown, bringing you all the stories of our local animals and just seeing how they change. Because right here in the UK now, we're in spring. This is the time of year when everything is changing every single day. So our swallows came back last week for the first time. I'm really crossing my fingers that they're going to nest underneath my dock again, because uh, that is just the most spectacular thing to see. And I'll have a camera in there so you'll be able to see them going in and, uh, and feeding their youngsters as well. Uh, let's go to a question. Uh, we have a, a great question here from Isla and Early, aged eight, and Rory, aged five, who wants to know which animal has the largest circulatory system. Uh, well, it's going to be the obvious answer. It's going to be one of the great whales, the, the blue whale, the say whale, uh, the fin whale. But the most interesting surely has to be the giraffe. So the giraffe, for, for obvious reasons, has a huge heart, a heart as much as 10 kilos, that's as much as a sack of potatoes, and their blood pressure is at least double that of any other similar sized mammal, just purely because it has to drive all that blood up through its circulatory system uh, towards its brain, which could be at the end of a... Uh, four or five meter long neck. Uh, we have uh, some wonderful questions here from Alex Tan, age nine, Eva nine, and Freddie seven, who are all kind of asking the same question. Why do domestic and big cats have eyes that reflect light? Well, it's not actually just the cats. In fact, most nocturnal animals have at the back of their eyes a structure called the tapetum lucidum. And that structure is effectively like a mirror. What it does is it reflects light back through the retina a second time. So it effectively doubles their perception of, of light in low light environments. So if you shine a light onto the eyes of a cat at night, then you get that greeny gold eye shine come back at you. If you shine it at a crocodile, you get a burning red eye shine coming back off spiders. It's a kind of silvery green uh, off night jars and moths. It tends to be orange. Hi to Thomas Foley in Ireland. I've just seen that uh, that pop up there. Hello, uh, Kobe age nine. Hello to you too. Uh, Jack Horson asking if Komodo dragons have venom. Yes, absolutely they do. Uh, and loads coming in on, uh, on Insta as well, which is absolutely brilliant stuff. Uh, right, I also told you guys that I'm going to be trying out some technology this time around as well. Uh, so I have set up my own little studio here so I can mix in both the cameras from my uh, wild, wild, wildlife but also uh, some video and photos as well. Um, I'm doing this all on my own so if it doesn't work then I, I massively apologise but last time round uh, I showed you how to make a wildlife pond uh, in your own garden and when I logged back onto Facebook I saw a photo of someone who'd made a wildlife pond and then I saw another and another 
and another and another and another. And when I got to about 100, I realised that this is evidently working. Uh, so uh, thank you all. Thank you so much for all the amazing photos of your ponds that you've sent in. I, I couldn't possibly give all the names, but let me just run through a few. I've got Noah and Elijah in Townsville, Ethan Williams, Emily Frearson, Georgina Kirk, Robert and Emily uh, William Oliver, Steve Frost, Callum and Luckland in Inverness, Ethan Callahan, Sarah Parr, Eliza Groves, William and Dexter, uh, Cohen Evans, Callum and Aaron, and so, so many more of you have sent in your photos of wildlife ponds. Thank you! That is amazing! It makes me feel very special and makes me know that these live lessons are, are working as well, which is just brilliant news. Um, there will be another make uh, in a little while. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to bring in pollinating insects like butterflies into your, your back garden using Backshaw's brilliant bugger tractor. Uh, so we'll be uh, we'll be doing that in a little while. But first of all, let's move on to some more, uh, some more questions. So... Uh, some actually link to the whole wildlife pond thing. We've got Sammy here, who's 10, who wants to know how newts end up in a wildlife pond. How do they know? We haven't put them in there. Well, one of the reasons for that is they, they travel over land. They're an animal that doesn't just live in the water. They can easily move out over land. Uh, they will, in fact, hibernate in the winter, usually in a, in a log pile. Very good reason to have a, a wild area of your garden is that frogs and newts may well choose to, to hibernate there. Um, Sebi, who's six, asks, do newts come from dinosaurs? Uh, no, they don't come from dinosaurs. In, in actual fact, uh, the amphibians are an older group than dinosaurs. They were around before the dinosaurs. Um, and Reuben, who's four, wants to know uh, what's the difference between amphibians and reptiles? Well, actually, they're they're quite different. I mean, there, there are things that, that they have that look similar. You look at a, a, a noose and you look at a lizard and they do appear to be quite similar, but really they are chalk and cheese. They are so, so different. So first of all, uh, reptiles are all obligate air breathers. They, they have lungs just like we do, whereas amphibians breathe through lungs, but also sometimes through gills, particularly when they are youngsters, and in some cases through their skin as well. Um, they have the different parts of their lives, so often they are tied to the water when they're an egg uh, and when they're a larva or a, a, a tadpole. That's not the same for reptiles. Reptiles uh, will usually look like they're going to look as an adult, just smaller, uh, right directly after they are born. Um, they're also uh, different in their age as well. So like I said, the amphibians are a really old group. They've been around since at least the Devonian. That's 400 million years ago. Whereas the reptiles, they've been around a long time as well, but not as long. So more like, um, well, it's the Carboniferous, so 300 million years ago. I mean, it might not sound like much, but it is a very, very long time in between the development of those two separate groups of animals. Uh, May, who's nine, asks, is there any animal that can breathe in the water and out of the water? Well, yes, the amphibians. I mean, that, that is kind of what amphibians mean, having having two lives, being able to live in, in two completely different environments. So, yes, the amphibians can breathe both in the water and out of the water. And some of them, as I said, can have a certain amount of gas exchange, can to a certain extent breathe through their skins. Uh, we have here um, Charlie Bloxham Patterson, who's seven, is a huge reptile fan. Uh, his favourite reptile is a reticulated python. Very, very good choice, Charlie. And he asks, are there snakes still undiscovered? Absolutely, without question. Uh, so we've done expeditions such as, for example, our expedition into the, uh, the volcano in New Guinea, where we came back with three different species of snakes, I think. Um, and uh, an awful lot of them are being discovered as well in the laboratory or even going back through museum specimens because we're finding that the genetics of snakes that we assumed were one species might actually lead them to be two, three or even four. Uh, we've got Corey from uh, Sydney, Australia, who's uh, getting in touch. Someone asking me if I'm doing the Aldo Kane expedition bit uh, workout. No, he does my workouts. I don't do his. Seriously, am I doing Aldo's workout? Actually, on that, um, uh, just a little shout out to all of you guys. Um, Helen, my wife, uh, is uh, an Olympic gold medalist. She's, she's the reigning Olympic uh, world rowing champion. And I, as you know, have to keep fit for expeditions, just like uh, just like Aldo. Uh, we were wondering if you might like to have one of these lessons that was a, a kind of a, a workout lesson. Um, obviously, there are lots and lots of those out there right now. Uh, and I understand that we might be a little bit overdosed with, with workout stuff. But 
If you'd like us to do one of these where we talk you through what we do in training, um, then give us a shout out now. I'll go back through the comments, and if there's enough of them, then we'll uh, we'll do one of those as well. Uh, what else have we got? Um, big shout out to Ruth and all the other teachers at Haymore School. Also, a shout out to uh, to Jack, Captain Jack, and to Tom, uh, who want to know how high can a great white shark jump. Well, we've free filmed uh, great whites breaching. That's when they come down to about 20 meters below the surface and rock it up vertically and hit an animal on the surface and then come up out of the water, momentum carrying them clear of the waves. Uh, and we've filmed them at least two meters clear of the water, which is which is higher than uh, higher than me uh, out of the water. Uh, let's go to some of my wildlife cams. So I told you that I was going to be uh, uh, showing you some of how spring is going on here uh, around my garden. And I'll start with uh, one of the birds, which actually to me is probably the most spectacular of this part of the world. Anyone tell me what this is? Uh, this is an animal which is one of the most successful reintroductions uh, we've ever had here in the UK. This one was filmed uh, just on the lamp, uh, the uh, sorry, the, the telegraph pole, which is no more than about 10 or 20 meters away from me here. And you can see there it's, it's a bird of prey. I'm getting lots and lots of people saying red kite. Yes, absolutely spot on. It is a red kite. So these were reintroduced here in the 1980s and are now probably our most conspicuous bird. Uh, this one here was filmed in my neighbor's back garden. Nice job, Pam. You can see it there taking off. Absolutely stunning. Uh, I haven't yet managed to find any uh, any nest sites for, uh, for red kites around the area, but trust me, I am looking and very much hoping to get a camera up in one of those nests uh, or near to one of those nests sometime soon. Uh, what we have very much got are lots and lots of garden birds and they're out already looking for nesting material. So this is, uh, right next to me, this is a blue tip which has in its beak a white feather which it's probably taking for, uh, for, its, for its nest. Where did it get that white feather? Well, on our lawn right now are these two. These are mute swans, that's the female, or pen, and that is the cob, uh, or the male. Uh, he has a, a much bigger bulb on the uh, on the beak there, you can see. And um, they have been nesting in or around our garden now for um, for the last few years. So this was two years ago. You can see the, uh, the female swan, the pen there, is uh, on a nest, and she's pulled not just sticks and uh, uh, other things that you'd imagine you'd expect to get uh, on a swan's uh, nest but also she's pulled in uh, our hose pipe and my expensive paddle there as well so we're very much hoping that the swans are going to be back again nesting this year They're, they are in the garden right now um, and hopefully we'll have some signets here that we'll be able to show you live and show you their development as uh, as they go through their uh, their year i have got a question coming about the swans actually from arthur who's nine in exeter uh, also as well from ernest and milo and they want to know how long does it take before a swan's egg hatches as they're watching a nest near to you so it's um it's quite a, an interesting process actually with swans so they will usually create the nest and then the female will lay an egg then she'll lay the next one maybe the next day or two days later and then the next one maybe two days later and two days later and two days later she doesn't start incubating them the whole incubating process starts when all of those eggs have been laid from there it's about 42 days to uh, to hatching and uh, you know the 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 success of that uh, nest is incredibly variable and the amount of those signets that will make it through to adulthood is again very very variable now uh, i did promise you last time round that i would be showing you some of my uh, my favorite local residents because we have got uh, near to us here um some amazing badger sets which are super super active i've had cameras on them uh, for the last few years and uh, these are the results i've had in the last couple of days from our badgers sets so this looks to me like a, a female she has quite a, a, a long slender muzzle you can see her there uh, going to the loo just outside the set and this is another animal looks like a male that's come in and it's very obviously standing there snipping away and it can smell her scent uh, and then another animal comes through i think it's a different animal this is no more than five ten minutes later and again stops in that exact same place which is probably a latrine so badgers use the same place for smells but look at this this is the cool bit just a little bit later on, one teeny tiny badger pops up to the edge of the set, completely different size to all the others, and I am convinced that that is our first 
cub. Uh, I've got some more footage of it here. Um, so you can see it's much, much smaller than the other animals. It seems uncertain. It's hanging out really, really close to the edge of the set as if it's uh, it's scared to go any further. And this one would probably have been born, um, it would have been conceived last year. So badgers have uh, uh, something quite a few mammals have called delayed implantation, which means that they will, they will essentially mate with the male, but they don't get properly pregnant until uh, many months later on. So this one would have been born in the den at the end of winter, and it's just now starting to, to come out and investigate, and hopefully we'll have lots, lots more uh, to show you from our badges over the next few weeks. So let's move on to some, some questions. What have I got coming in? Lots and lots of people tuning in from uh, from Australia, actually, which is wonderful. Um, I, I honestly wanted to try and get this at a much better time for people in the UK and people in Australia, um, but it was really tricky, particularly as uh, Joe Wicks has stolen that nine o'clock time slot. Done it! <laughs> which uh, was, would have been much, much better for everyone uh, as out in, uh, in Australia. Uh, what have we got? We've got lots and lots... Is there a parrot that can fly faster than a cheetah? Asks uh, uh, Ellie DePaolo. Well, uh, the obvious answer to that is cheetahs can't fly. So yes, absolutely there is. Uh, Jess Sharma in Melbourne, Australia has been trying to find stick insects in our backyard. Um, I don't know if you've got stick insects in your backyard, but all I can say is uh, just keep lying, looking and keep persevering. Uh, Tolly, who's aged five in Buckingham, wants to know, are cassowary the most dangerous bird for humans? Uh, well, they are listed in the Guinness Book of Animal Records, yes, as being uh, the most dangerous bird. They have this amazing raptorial claw, which they use in defence. Uh, and um, Yes, they, they can effectively uh, eviscerate or disembowel uh, other animals sometimes. Now, this is a really cool question. I've got one that's come in here. It's cool, uh, from Mark, who wants to know what creature has the sharpest teeth. A friend once told me that it's a limpet. That can't be right, surely, can it? Well, um, actually, your friend has a point. Uh, limpets certainly have the, the strongest, the hardest teeth of any, any creature. Anyone who, who can't imagine what a limpet is, it's one of those creatures you get on rocks at the seaside. It's kind of pyramid-shaped. Uh, they look like they don't move at all, but they do. They, they just move very, very slowly, and they, they graze on algae on the surface of the rocks. So uh, limpet have um, a, a, a radula, a, a kind of like a, a tongue which is covered in teeth, tiny, tiny, tiny teeth that are made up of a mineral protein composite that is the strongest biological material known to science. It is at least five times stronger than spider silk, which was the, the previous record holder. So it's possibly true. I mean, they certainly have the strongest teeth of any animal on the planet. Uh, but in terms of the sharpest, I think that you've got to go a long way to do better than this. These obviously are the teeth of a piranha. This is a, uh, a red-bellied piranha, very much a dried, dead red-bellied piranha. But you can see there those interlocking teeth, which are truly scalpel sharp. Uh, and if you need any more proof of how sharp they are, well, I have pretty much lost two or three fingertips to piranhas over the years. Uh, they are ridiculously sharp. Um, quite often, though, piranhas are, are not the predators people expect them to be. I've, I've dived alongside them. I've swum alongside them. Um, and as long as you are not um, struggling, you're not bleeding, uh, you're not giving out signs of stress in the water, they, they tend to leave you well alone, which is just as well, because look at those teeth. Aren't they absolutely Awesome. Um, okay, what else have we got here? Um, so Gruff, who's nine, says, Thorny devils can shoot blood out of their eyes. What other freaky animal skills do you know of? Uh, well, Gruff, um, I think you're thinking of the horned lizard. It's not thorny devil. Thorn thorny devil is uh, an Australian lizard. They're just the most remarkable creatures. They're like, they're like uh, little clockwork toys that, that pluck ants um, off, off the ground. Um, and they're not the ones. It's actually uh, the Phrynosoma lizards that are found in, uh, in southern North America. They're the ones that can squirt blood out of their eyes. Uh, Megan, who's seven, asks... Do turtles really breathe out of their bums? Uh, well, not all turtles and not all 
the time. But there is something called cloacal respiration. Cloaca is effectively uh, the bottom. And yes, there are some turtles like the uh, Fitzroy River turtle that uh, that does use cloacal respiration, as well as uh, some turtles when they are when they're hibernating will also do a certain amount of breathing through their bums. Um, we've got Millie, eight, uh, Ethan, Josh, and Lizzie, uh, who all would like to know why her bunny has eyes on the side of his head and not on the front like a human's. That is, actually, that's a great question, and it's one which I can illustrate uh, with with some skulls. So let's start off with, uh, with this skull here. This is a, uh, a steer skull. It is an absolutely classic uh, skull of a herbivore or a so-called prey animal. And as you have said with your bunny, the eyes are on the side of the head. That means that the big bulbous eyes enable it to see not just forwards, but also behind it as well. It has an amazing field of view. So it has wonderful vision looking behind it. So if anything's trying to creep up on it, if a predator is trying to get close to it, it can see it back over its shoulder. There is, though, a drawback to this, because when these eyes look forward, the vision from the left eye and the right eye don't overlap that much. And where the vision of the left eye and the right eye overlap is incredibly important. So predators like, for example, this bear have their eyes looking forwards. And those eyes have a significant amount of intersection between the vision of the left eye and the right eye. And where you have intersection of those uh, those eyes, you get um, binocular stereoscopic vision. Now, there's something you can try out yourselves now. If you've got a table in front of you that's got some, I don't know, pencils or something on it, uh, if you close your eyes for a second and then close one eye and just using the other, just try and really quickly grab and pick up that pencil. You'll probably miss. Now, if you open both eyes up and you try for it, you'll almost certainly succeed. That's because you have better depth perception where the vision from your left eye and your right eye overlap. Now, in humans and other primates, it is even better. So I've got here a human skull and you can see the eyes are completely forward facing. So something creeps up on you from behind and you're not going to see it. No chance. But you have got superb depth perception, some of the best of any animals. And yes, we are a, an animal with predatory origins. But probably why this has evolved is because our cousins, our primate cousins, spend a lot of time in the treetops, leaping hand over hand through the branches. Um, being able to perceive if a branch is a metre and a half ahead of you or two metres ahead of you is the difference between catching that branch or falling to your death. And so this forward facing eyes, but with a much, much reduced navel cavity, not such a good sense of smell, uh, has become incredibly important and is a huge part uh, of our success as a species. Helen, have you got something for me? I've just got some hellos for you. Uh, I've, I've got a bunch of hellos here, so hello to Paddy, Liz, Charlie, Dave from Germany, Rachel from Scotland, Owen, Arwen, Ira, Gwydion, Martha and George, Lincoln and Amaya, again from Australia. Hello to all my, my chums out there in Oz. Uh, Arthur and Charlie, Ethan Webb, Olivia and Jake, to Sam in the Isle of Wight, uh, to Ali and Tallulah from, uh, from lovely Jess. Hey, Ali and Tallulah, how are you doing? Uh, is that Ali or Atty? I think it's Atty. To Ella... Oscar and Harrison, Matty, Luca and Gwen from Wales as well. Thank you very much, Hells. Uh, so let's quickly do, people have been liking the, uh, the sounds quiz. So let's quickly do a few animal sounds. And I want you guys to tell me if you can figure out what they come from. So uh, first of all, let's go for um, a, a mammal sound. Who knows what makes a sound like this? So if we're looking at the skulls, this is one that would have one of these kind of herbivore, prey type skulls, uh, and it comes from Africa. Play that one more time. Okay, now we'll do, uh, all right, yeah, I think we get the message. Now we'll do one that comes from right here in this country, and this is one that would have uh, eyes that are forward facing. It is a predator.
So this is a sound that I'm guessing has woken many of you up in the middle of the night, had you absolutely cursing, probably chucking tin cans and boots and that sort of thing out to try and frighten it away. Uh, so this is a predator. Uh, that's our second animal. And let's go for our third. What should we go for? Okay, so this is a, this is a classic. This is one that uh, I absolutely love. It is not a mammal. It's a reptile. And it sounds... It sounds like a terrible case of indigestion. But actually, that is a an infrasound call made by the male of this not mammal. Uh, let's see if we've got some answers coming in here. So we've got lots of people saying hyena. No, no, that's not that's not right. We've got Paul Wolverson and Nick uh, McKenzie. You both say zebra for our first call. Absolutely spot on. Very well done. Uh, Max is also saying zebra. Yes, superb. Really good, jo good, good job. Alex from Alexander's Journey saying hyena. Hello, uh, uh, old bean. Really, really nice to hear from you. But you're not right, sadly. Uh, lots more. Jamila saying zebra. Uh, what else have we got? Has anyone come in with a few people saying hyena for the um I, i'm guessing for the one which actually is the british native which is that one so that is actually a red fox so this is a call actually i've heard this one particularly from vixens at night from females uh, and they're using it um as an advertisement, essentially, to try and get a hold of a male. Uh, anyone coming in for our last sound, the non-mammal, which is this one? What have we got? Oh, yes, I've got a couple here. Adamson on uh, on Instagram, who's saying crocodile. Yes, sensational. Uh, Kahula saying it's something that's behind you. I don't think so. Uh, Mandeville saying red fox. Really good job. Uh, yeah, we've got someone else here. Emma and Mandeville both saying crocodile. Really good job. Yes, so that is actually uh, the call of a male American alligator. Right, now last time uh, we had really, really good responses from... Um, from our build, from the uh, from the build of a wildlife pond. So I'm going to do a quick one now uh, to try and give you an idea of something that you can do in your own back garden to try and attract in pollinators like butterflies and bees. Effectively, what we're going to start off with is a uh, little pot like this. You're going to take the lid of that pot, punch a hole through it, and put a small piece of sponge into that hole. Then you put into this jar uh, some water and a spoonful of sugar and mix it all up uh, so that it forms a kind of fake nectar and you're then going to decorate it because you could not possibly have a bug attractor that doesn't look a bit like this. So for this I have taken a bit of Logan, my little boy's artwork and I have uh, cut it up into a flower and that is then going to hang upside down like that and this will attract uh, bees, it may attract butterflies you could have a whole bunch of them hanging together, possibly over the uh, your, if you are lucky enough to have a garden, uh, the area of your garden where you keep nectar-rich flowers, which can be enticing in all of the lovely uh, bees and butterflies. So things like, um, like Buddleia and Red Valerian uh, and Marjoram, those kinds of flowers that you could have that will bring in these pollinators, which are so, so important to us. And uh, yeah, we should be doing everything we can to try and encourage them back into our gardens. Uh, so many questions. Charlie Harris, age 11, asks, how do the stomach spines in a pangolin work? Well, they're kind of similar to the uh, to the gizzard in, in some kinds of bird. They grind up um, the, um, the food that the animal has taken in. Uh, we have here, this is a question quite a few have been asking, actually, which is, if you could bring any extinct animal back, what would it be? And for me, I think there's no kind of point in thinking about bringing back something that's been extinct for a long time the dinosaurs because you know our whole world has changed so much from from the world that they left behind it would have to be something that we've lost relatively recently and for me it would have to be the thylacine or tasmanian tiger so the last one of those uh, disappeared in the 1930s this one was filmed in hobart zoo in uh, in tasmania it was called freddy um and it was a sort of marsupial wolf. Uh, so it, it's an animal that's not been extinct very long. In fact, the Guinness Book of Animal Records lists it as being the most frequently seen extinct animal on the planet, um, which kind of means that lots and lots of people think they've seen thylacines, think that they, they still may be around. Um, I don't think that they are, 
but it would be amazing to have them back because they are a remarkable animal lost by our uh, carelessness and stupidity and therefore very much down to us uh, to do something about making sure we don't lose other animals because you know we are losing so many to extinction uh, at the moment uh, what else have we got uh, we've got morgan age nine who'd like to know how much more superior is a dog's sense of smell to a humans and what breed of dog has the best sense of smell um so uh, the breed actually it's kind of more species really the uh, the wolf has the best sense of smell even better than, than things like a bloodhound um and there's lots and lots of reasons for that so a dog has two different air passages, one for breathing and another for smelling, and they can uh, maintain scents in that part of their, their olfactory bulbs uh, for longer, so they can keep hold of it longer. They have that wet uh, nose, which keeps a hold of scent molecules for longer. Um, they also have the part of their brain that processes uh, smells. The olfactory cortex is about 40 times more powerful than that of a human being. So uh, again, they are just so much better than us. In fact, it's usually believed that they're between one and 10,000 times better at processing smells than we human beings. Uh, Chloe Michelle Atkinson uh, says, uh, how did the harpy eagle become so rare? Uh, mostly habitat loss. I mean, some of them have been uh, have been collected or killed because they're believed to be persecuting uh, livestock, but mostly uh, down to human habitat loss. Um, Finn, who's nine, and Fraser, who are 11, what mammal eats the biggest prey in comparison to their own size? Um, stoats and the weasels here in this country are pretty good, but it's probably the wolf. Wolverine, you know, a wolverine uh, can take down an adult moose, which is way, way bigger than they could possibly be. Someone there saying, uh, I have an Alaskan, that's Alaska snow, I have an Alaskan Malamute. What a dog! You are a very, very lucky person. Must be tricky keeping them exercised while we're on lockdown, though. My goodness, I don't envy you that. Um, what else have we got? Let's get some a few more questions. Uh, we are almost out of time, but I just want to make sure that I'm uh, keeping as many questions out there as possible. Um, hello from Lauren. Hello from Bogner. Percy. Hello. Um, we've got wh which snake has the biggest venom glands? Oh, you put me on the spot now. It, I think in in proportion to their size, um, it's some of the New World coral snakes have just gigantic um, venom glands, very, very small uh, bat fangs though, and they're not massively uh, aggressive. Um, we have Evie in Scotland, how big is a king cobra? The biggest that have ever been measured was 5.8 meters in length, which is about the length of a limousine, making it the longest venomous snake in the world. The outdoor kid with the pike in my local canal attacked the ducklings, that's Miller, age six. Absolutely, it's been seen and even filmed uh, happening. Um, Freya, age eight. Hello, hello, Emily from uh, London. Lucas from Liverpool. Uh, absolutely incredible. Uh, Will eleven. What's the smallest living organism? Uh, it depends what your your perception of living is. I mean, certainly viruses are, are pretty small, and a lot of people would, uh, particularly now, be saying that they are uh, without question living. They're certainly evolving. Um, what have we got? Someone from Cookham there. Hello, hello. You must be uh, very close. Uh, da, 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 da. Hello from Elsie. Hello from Josh and Zach. Let me see if we can get in one more question before we finish. Um, uh, so Ridley from Leeds would like to ask, what is the world's smallest bird and what is the world's smallest species of mammal? Well, the smallest bird is usually believed to be the, the bee hummingbird uh, and the smallest mammal could actually be the bumblebee bat or uh, the white-toothed or savvy's shrew. All three of those animals are, are no bigger than the end of my little finger. Um, we've got here Joshua, aged 10, and Noah, aged 8. Are there any venomous butterflies? Um, not venomous, but there are poisonous ones. In fact, there's lots and lots of poisonous ones that would be really unpleasant to eat. Aidenfell from Leeds. What birds are in the same family as a roadrunner? They're in the cuckoo family, I think. Although, obviously, they, they look nothing like the cuckoos that we get here in this country. Right, OK, so we are... We are past 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, it's time for me to be wrapping up. Uh, I promise that I'm going to be getting out there and putting more cameras on uh, on different nests around the garden. I'll be bringing you more from our swans, from our badgers. Uh, hopefully we'll get something from our, uh, our, our foxes as well. I'm pretty sure I've managed to find a location uh, where foxes are denning and hopefully we'll be able to bring you some images from those as well, as well as answering as many of your questions as possible. I'll go back through all of these. I'll try and find out if there's any appetite for a uh, for a fitness session with Helen and I. Um, obviously, we'll do it at a completely different time to, to Joe, and we'll try and make it as different as possible. Um, and uh, to all of you out there on lockdown, um, I just want to have a massive, massive shout out to all of you. Um, just 
I, I think don't let your love for nature, which is coming pouring back at me from all your questions, don't let that love uh, start to fade away. You know, nature is going to need us uh, when this lockdown comes to an end, and we are very much going to need it as well. So thank you all so, so much for tuning in. I will speak to you all the same time next week, and uh, all the very best from me, Stevie B.